Welcome back to the Innovation Engine podcast. I'm your host and Three Pillars Chief Evangelist, Scott Barho, and I am thrilled to be joined today by Aisha Armstrong. Aisha is the co-founder of Vectorus, where she works with B2B services companies to productize their offerings. As part of this work, she advises CEOs and product management professionals and helps companies transform their cultures to allow innovation to flourish. Aisha is the author of Fearless, How to Transform Services Culture and Successfully Productize, and a second book, Productize, The Ultimate Guide to Turning Professional Services into Scalable Products. She has more than 20 years of experience launching new data and information service businesses, managing multi-million dollar businesses, and leading global teams of professionals. During her career, Aisha has facilitated more than 100 leadership development and executive education sessions around the globe. Aisha, thanks so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is really yeah. a joy. And as I mentioned, this is incredibly timely, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to have some fun with you um, uh, deviating from the, the, the promised uh, script. But, um, but I, I think as a foundation, it's good for us to start with um, sort of the, the, the foundation for your latest book from your white paper, where you state, uh, for most B2B services organizations, productization is a combination of, of three important aspects. One, new product innovation, two, digital transformation, and three, business model change, all wrapped up in one strategy, which each one of those can be a challenging topic in and of itself. Um, so so how, how do you recommend that companies do all three at once and, and find that good spot? <laughs> Very carefully. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I think you point to a great uh, thing, which is that trying to do all three at once is incredibly challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we first suggest that organizations do is to get really clear on what is your goal, hmm. because your goal uh, may actually lead you in a direction where you don't need to do all three of those at once, or you can stagger adding in different elements. So for example, is your goal to compete more effectively against digital first companies that are taking market share? right? Like accounting firms losing audit business to AI powered competitors, uh, law firms, market research firms, all asking themselves, what do we do right now in this, this era of generative AI? Mm. Uh, and so if it's a digital threat, uh, then there's probably is going to be some component of digital uh, transformation as well as innovation, maybe business model change, maybe not. If your goal simply is to scale more efficiently, so to automate work that's previously done by arms and legs or redesign it work so it can be done by less specialized talent, uh, then you may not have to do that uh, doing um, business model change. Uh, if it's a valuation bump, uh, you know, do you have an eye on an exit? Uh, so you're trying to get more recurring revenue that may necessitate a business model change. So getting really clear on the goal is important. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask, what are the array of opportunities that get us closer to that goal? What resources do we have? Where can we get some easy wins to start to build this muscle of productization? And then that helps you break it down into more manageable pieces. Do you have ways, because I mean, in my experience, uh, when you ask those questions, wh which of these are your goals? They're like, yes, those. <laughs> <laughs> you have a way that you walk them through. Because ultimately, you know, yeah, they want all these things, right? They want to be more efficient and they want to scale and grow and, and so forth. But getting executives to prioritize those things or rack, rank them so that yeah. we can sort of optimize effort to to achievement um, is is an art in and of itself. Um, totally. Do, how, how do you walk them through that, that yeah. process? I, I've so, been seemingly un, unsuccessful. <laughs> the first one is to get everything out. So what are the array of opportunities? Hmm. Uh, and, and you know, let's say you're still disagreeing on the goal. You do have to prioritize your, your goal. Hmm. Um, and you can do that using simple, you know, risk reward uh, matrices, you know, value versus complexity. Um, but hmm. getting everything out and then starting to map the opportunities based on the value created and the the effort or complexity you know that's going to be required. Mm -hmm. And then honestly Scott, you need to think of it as a portfolio. So especially given how quickly technology is moving these days, mm -hmm. like you don't just want to start going after those easy wins that have low 
investment required, you probably want to start pursuing some longer term strategic, more expensive uh, efforts, but just recognize that those easy wins are going to be important to get, you know, win the hearts and minds of the, the rest of the organization, get some positive momentum, start to assess the skill set of your team. Mm-hmm. Do you mm-hmm. really have productization capabilities within the organization or do you have to go out right. and, and uh, acquire those? So uh, thinking about it as a portfolio is is usually what we advise. But yeah, there has to be some upfront prior prioritization discussion around what criteria are you going to use to prioritize opportunities uh, and and then keep pulling up and reevaluating as you're learning more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh gosh, that I mean the 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 process of 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 trying things and then gaining feedback that feedback loop that I find is so often missing. Um, in addition to um, you already you, you you kind of hinted at this, but I think it's so important. I would love for you to say a little more. Like getting leadership to get on the same page around which of these goals is most important and which you know because the the fact is that we do need to hold all these things together in tension, but we need to also know what to do and to arm our people to know what to do when they come in conflict. And, and that's where the cultural element of, you know, you need, you need, op, uh, you know, uh, uh, optimism uh, to take advantage of the opportunity and you need that momentum. Those quick wins can create that this is, this is going to lead somewhere better. Um, um, but then you also need that feedback loop of wait, like this isn't going the way we thought. So what does that mean? Do we have the wrong people on the bus? Do we, is there something, is there an impediment in the system we didn't recognize? I, I'm just curious to hear more ab- about that linkage between these, these goals that executives, even if you're able to get them to get on consensus, which is a challenge, <laughs> then, then how that plays out going forward. Yeah. So, I mean, governance processes certainly help. Uh, and it, usually at this point of maturity, I recommend pulling up monthly uh, mm. and evaluating the portfolio and the new market information. Um, but as I'm sure you well know, like a governance process is not the answer. You also mm. have to be assessing skills, the you know the behaviors of people on a day to day basis, which you know that's that, that's the root of cultures, how we behave. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but some type of, of governance process where you've got a structured time and set of people that are pulling up, looking at the new information, reprioritizing based on that information, and then holding hands and, and agreeing to you know, a new set of priorities if, if you know, the market has shifted and you've learned something new that, that causes you to reprioritize. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I like about focusing on governance early is that it can be a, a Trojan horse for change management um, Mm. in that you invite people into the governance process that perhaps are naysayers about the productization strategy. Uh, You're using uh, criteria that you've all agreed are important. So it's a way of like reinforcing, like, no, actually we're not focused on revenue this year anymore when we're talking about products. We're not focused on profitability this year when we're talking about new products. So it's a way to just kind of reinforce that you have to approach this in a different way than you you approach your legacy services business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and one thing that I've become keenly aware in our own efforts on this front has been that portfolio approach, right? We have offerings that we're trying to productize to achieve certain aspects of our strategy. So you know, often te- you know, companies will talk about land and expand. Well, a land offering should be structured differently than an expand offering. Um, and, and then the relationship between those should also be somewhat thoughtful in terms because you want that one to convert to the other. So um, really fascinating uh, as, I, as I get into the, the, chess, the chess match of, of productization and product portfolios of services. So, you know, and, and yeah, don't know. Um, we haven't had a uh, time to talk a lot about history, but a lot of my time has been spent actually building products, not services. Um, and so it's been very interesting to try to take what I know about building products and apply them at a services company. And 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 you um, talk about this like fear can be one of the the things that really holds companies back from embracing the kind of changes that we're talking about. I mean, whether I mean you could have picked any one of those things that we talked about that are necessary for this innovation, digital transformation, all of these are threatening and have a fear component tied to them. Um, even deciding priorities can be very threatening. Um, so what are some ways that you you recommend tackling that that fear at, at different levels? Yeah, that's such a good point. I mean, because at the root of everything is uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And as humans, we, we are wired 
right? To avoid uncertainty. I mean, fear is one of the most primitive human emotions because it helps keep us safe. Mm -hmm. It's essential to our, our survival. Uh, so we're wired to avoid uncertainty and taking unnecessary risks. Um, I think I think the first step is just naming it and having a conversation about it. So one of the things that we tried to do was catalog, you know, of all of the interviews that we did and client work, you know, what were the different um, categories of fears that we saw coming up in leaders as well as in employees. And they, they fell into three different categories. The first one was financial. So we're going to lose money. Are we going to turn down this year revenue? Uh, you know, our lower price products are going to cannibalize higher price services. Mm. Financial fear is a big category. Second one is reputational. And, mm. and this gets to like feelings of personal worthiness that me, we may not feel comfortable talking about at work, but, you know, it, am I still going to have value to the organization if you standardize mm -hmm. or tech enable what I've been doing? Um, you know, if I say no to a client, uh, are they going to dislike me? Uh, mm. If I show them an, a client an MVP, uh, are they going to you know, judge me because it's not perfect by design? Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that kind of like fear of reputation, what are people going to think of me? Do I still have value? Uh, that's, that's a big meaty one. Uh, and then the third category is you know, fear of change, what we call routine fears. Mm. Uh, so I have to learn new skills. Maybe I lose control over customer relationships, things like that. Um, so that just getting clear on like, what is the fear and talking about it, that kind of, you have to name it to tame it idea. Yeah. Uh, it's really important first step. So powerful to, to name those fears. Absolutely. And, and the reputational one is the one that I find is the most insidious because it's the one, it's also the one that you're least likely to cop to. Um, you know, the other ones are like, oh, these are business fears, right? Like they're not, they're not about me. The reputational one is uniquely about my own fear of, of how, how people perceive me. And it's been really interesting watching the generative AI push because there's such a, the hype cycle is intense. Um, so many people are saying nothing will ever be the same again. And yet there's a lot of people walking around going, can I ask ChatGPT what generative AI is? Because <laughs> I don't <laughs> understand it. I really don't. So, and, and watching executives really struggle to, to admit, and, and I often have to create safe spaces for them to say, I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> oh, of so, course. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's, 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 I mean, it's not, it, it's not new. We've, we've been through a few hype cycles now where it's like, you know, the FOMO, a fear of missing out, as well as the, the fear of looking, looking like you don't know what you're talking about both at play at the same time. Um, right. and, uh, and that can create a lot of, uh, a lot of poor decision-making. Um, and, and, you know, along those lines, I think, it, you know, and perhaps we should have started here with what, what are the benefits of for services companies shifting to this uh, mm -hmm. more product oriented, uh, product driven culture? Um, what are some of the biggest upsides that you see in that transformation? Yeah. So I, I think the first one is improving margins. Hmm. So productization, whether it's just standardization without tech enablement or with tech enablement should make it more uh, cost effective to deliver your services. Uh, there's also the benefit, and I alluded to this earlier, of a valuation bump, increasing your valuation. Uh, so if we work with a lot of private equity owned firms or companies where perhaps you know, they're closely held and they're looking for an exit in the next five to six years, getting more recurring revenue, um, improving those gross margins is, is definitely going to increase valuation. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I also said, you know, fending off digital competitors or competitors who are perhaps more mature in their use of technology um, is can be both, you know, a, a reason to do it, but also an opportunity. Um, if you're looking around and your competitors are not as digitally mature yet, uh, mm -hmm. There's an opportunity there to think of more creatively. I mean, technology, again, is moving so quickly. Like, how are we using generative AI? How are we using low-code, no-code to standardize our, our, you know, delivery of services at the very least? COVID was a great accelerator um, yeah. for tech enablement of services. So, you know, both threat and opportunity. Um, I think more practically, I do believe, and the data supports us, that buyers are changing. Uh, so buyers do want to um, uh, experience uh, working with a vendor before committing to significant spend. And that is, you know, true whether they're buying a technology product or not. Uh, mm -hmm. 
they want more frictionless end to end experiences. So, you know, our consumer buying experiences are shaping how we buy B2B services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that's another, I think, you know, good thing to keep in mind. Uh, Availability of talent. Uh, So even though the market shifted a little bit in the last six months, you know, it's still hard to find certain um, areas of expertise, professional services, talent. If you can standardize tech enable, uh, you can deliver those services with less specialized talent. Yeah. It's so interesting for me to reflect on on my years as a buyer of these services and to think about how I wanted to know what I'm paying for, what I'm going to get as crisply as possible. But of course, what I want, it requires human capital and and some problem solving. So the vendor has a hard time promising me, or maybe they they promise freely, which is even worse. Uh, Over promising and underwhelming is 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 a pattern. Um, but um, but if they're actually trying to be honest, they're like, yeah, I don't exactly know how long this is going to take and, and I don't know how much it's going to cost, but it should be roughly around here. So there's sort of this urge to have more predictability in the process as well, which helps with those margins, helps with efficiency, helps with uh, talent acquisition, uh, making sure you have the right people trained up to do the right job at the right time, uh, produce those, those repeatable results for clients. But at the end of the day, the client typically has a problem that is somewhat unique to them. Um, and so the, the bespoke nature, I, I've often joked that I want to I want to give you a Big Mac and make you feel like you got the most custom you know right. made hamburger ever, right? Like because your problem is totally different from everybody else's, except you're going to buy the same thing from me that everybody else has bought. Right. Um, so so there's always that tension, right? The, the personalization of the service, but then also the okay, you've done this before, which which brings uh, some benefits. But there is a real tension there um, between trying to make your your clients feel really special and unique while delivering them a product a, a service that has been codified into a product. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. So most of the organizations that we work with are going to market with what we call bundled solutions. Hmm. So there's still a services element and an opportunity to customize. It's just less than it was before. Hmm. And, And they're adding to that intellectual property. It could be in the form of technology, could be in the form of data, um, in order to get that scale, that um, assurance of quality, that mm-hmm. um, predictability that you're talking about. So it's, you know, it's, it's, there are some organizations that we work with that have decided to completely sunset customized services, but those are the exception. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's honestly not something that I, I recommend <laughs> unless you've found an amazing opportunity, in which case you should probably set up a different company to go pursue that and think mm-hmm. of that more as a spinoff. Um, but you've got amazing assets in your client relationships and your specialized professionals. You don't want to walk away from that. But it's right. like, how do you add on top of that, then that that ability to scale, that leveraging of your existing IP, the data, whatever. Um, so you, you share a, a number of stats in your in your book um, that that substantiate the importance of organizations learning to productize. Um, and one that I thought was, was that caught my eye was McKinsey researchers shared that nearly 70% of top economic performers across all business sectors use their own s- software to differentiate themselves from their competitors. Moreover, one third of those top performers monetize software directly. This was interesting to me um, that, that it's, that it's that high. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so this this is, came from a white paper that McKinsey put out in December, right around the holidays, and it was breathlessly titled "Every Company is a Software Company." Uh, <laughs> so it's definitely you know titled to get lots of clicks, um, right? <laughs> but you know, McKinsey they they do this great research where they, um, you know, they look at companies within an industry and they separate the top performers from everybody else. I think they use total shareholder return like they typically do in a lot of their studies and then went in to understand what are the top performers doing differently. Hmm. Uh, And that's where they saw this trend of, no, they're definitely ahead of the game in terms of developing their own software for competitive differentiation and not just to, you know, we talk about digital transformation. It's usually about back office. It's not Hmm. just about back office automation, it is also about monetizing that software. Uh-huh. And, and again, it could be bundled solutions, could be own products, but, but that's fascinating because then there's another stat in the same study, which is if you look at um, 
who gets the lion's share of software revenue, right? It's tech native companies. Mm. It is not non-tech native who've developed their own software and then go, go out and try to monetize it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they're, you know, a third are, are trying to monetize it. Uh, but, but this is a very difficult thing to do, mm -hmm. uh, because it, like you're, you're alluding to, like there, that's a significant transformation that you have to undertake, to get, you know, especially like, you know, services to software products, but even manufacturing to software products or, um, you know, consumer goods to software products, retail to software. I mean, that, that's, th those are all significant transformations. Absolutely. Uh, so kind of diving a little bit further into, into your research, you, you identified five levers that companies can pull to enable a product friendly cu culture. Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated by these. Can you share those, those levers and, and a little bit of background on them? Yeah. So the first one is your vision. So what I talked about at the very beginning, what, what are you trying to accomplish? Like, so you important. Just, right. You just want <laughs> bundles, we right. Do you just want bundled solutions or do you want to shut down your, uh, you know, time and materials business? Like what, mm. what are you trying to do? Uh, and why? Like, what's the impact on your employees? What's the impact on your on your customers, on society? Like, the, the amazing thing about productization is you can 10x your impact. Uh, so that could yes. be very inspiring, right? Um, so getting that vision right is is so so important. And then you need to look at um, your organizational structure. Uh, so somebody has to be responsible for this. You cannot do this well off the side of your desk. It requires dedicated resources. That may be one person to begin with, but that person has to be dedicated. There needs to be uh, clear, clear roles and responsibilities for this. Mm -hmm. uh, governance, which I talked about earlier, that's, that's another of the, the key levers. So, you know, the governance structures to ensure that the vision is realized by creating more discipline, accountability, uh, not just kind of setting people off in a direction and having them, you know, come back six months later, mm -hmm. um, but continuing to evaluate that that market feedback. And well, the, and that was that was the point that I was just going to ask: is does that governance include bi-directional communication so that we can discover obstacles that we didn't foresee? I, sometimes I see governance as simply simply accountability. We told you to go execute, right. you haven't, and now we're mad. Yeah, um, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that that's governance not gone wrong. Yeah, <laughs> that's not good innovation <laughs> governance. Yeah, yeah. So definitely needs to be two way. Um, it mm -hmm. definitely needs to have built into it. You know what what have we learned from the market? So customer feedback, usage data, competitive updates. Um, those are all very very important components to you know, monthly or quarterly product reviews, product portfolio reviews is what they're typically called. Makes um, sense. Yeah. Talent. Uh, so, the, you know, the reason why we like uh, focusing on a couple of easy wins at the beginning is you can evaluate your talent. Do mm. they have the productization skills to do this? Or are we going to have to go out and invest in new hires? Again, probably going to bring, have to bring in some new people into the organization. Um, hmm. People who have distinguished themselves their entire career by providing bespoke services have a very difficult time changing their behavior to make this strategy successful. Not because they're mm -hmm. bad people, yeah. but because behavior change is hard. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, if you're used to being um, working in that kind of bespoke environment, then you don't have constraints, right? We, we don't have to, we don't have to work within constraints. I don't have to make that trade off. And so it's a very different trade off to say, I'm going to accept constraints because I get these benefits, but oftentimes folks that have, have been steeped in that culture. Yeah. They just, they just see it as handcuffs. Why are you, you're limiting me. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I've, I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, it's like the technology I... can do it. It's like, yes, the technology can do it, but we made a choice not to do that. Um, remember the talk? No. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. <laughs> so. And again, it's like they're, they're trying to do what's best for the client. Right? That's right. But yep. they're thinking this client. No, they're not thinking the market segment. Right. Right. It's just not the I way often, they're wired. I often joke. It's, it's, you're winning at checkers, but we're playing chess. Yes. Um. <laughs> Ooh, I remember to use that. That's a good one. <laughs> I was like, yes, you will take this piece, but that's that's not really advancing us. So, Oops. yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry, the I cut you off. The the fifth. Oh, the last one, uh, people related practices. So that's that's mm. a fancy way of saying uh, performance measures. You know, are are we going to hold this new product? Um, you know, give it an, a profitability goal in year one? No, please don't do that. Um, 
what are our incentives? Uh, how are we assessing? How are we training? How much operational freedom do we give people? All of that kind of falls into this bucket of uh, people related practices. Yep, totally yeah. makes sense. Um, yeah. And gosh, I've seen I've seen companies fall down on any one of these five, five levers here. So um, or, or forget that they're important. Um, so those are, those are great. And um, I, I I just love this name partially. I think because of a movie I just watched recently. But um, who or or what are the four horsemen of productization and their yeah. anecdotes or <laughs> or antidotes? Not anecdotes. Antidotes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm glad you like the naming of that. Um, so based on our research, we did identify kind of four clear dangers uh, to you know developing a product friendly culture, and I think it's important to um, identify those first so you can eliminate them, and then you can replace them with product friendly behaviors. Uh, mm. So those those four horsemen, uh, as as we call them, are. Um, uh, first, uh, fear of, uh, sorry, strike that. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> okay, editor. Problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the four horsemen are knowing. This is the first one. Perfectionism, second. Scarcity mm -hmm. thinking is third. And then individual heroics uh, is fourth. So mm -hmm. knowing is when you believe you need to be the expert. Mm. And you struggle to admit when you're wrong or you don't know. Like, I actually don't know how big this market is. I don't actually know if this is a customer problem. Uh, I need to go discover it. Yep. Um, perfectionism gets in the way of delivering MVPs uh, and bringing in customers along the development cycle. Uh, scarcity thinking, that's, that's when we believe that um, our existing resources are fixed and that the amount that customers will spend with us is more limited than it actually is. Hmm. That's and interesting. Yeah, and it's what gets in, uh, it's what causes kind of that fear of cannibalization to shut down. Like the zero sum thinking. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. And then the last one, individual heroics is, you know, when you think asking for help is a sign of weakness or, you know, your individual performance <laughs> is more valuable than team, things like that. Yeah. yeah. So, those are the four the four horsemen of productization, and it's but it's just interesting too because it, as I think about the the word accountability is so interesting um, because I, and I've had numerous conversations with with uh, um, leaders here at Three Pillar about this. Um, accountability can be a very threatening word because it's like I, this is what I told you again, like you know, governance is I told you what to do and it's not done, so therefore we have governance. And uh, I'm like, ah, I don't really think that's what this is supposed to be for. I think we're supposed to have an exchange about information and, and make some decisions about how to, how to move forward best. But um, but these these horsemen can be you know either under undermined or or mitigated um, or or um, really accentuated in in the way that leadership proceeds. And it's um, I'm curious how you would how you advise leaders to both be confident and pushy for where they're trying to go to achieve their goals and also sensitive and supporting because you're going through a, you're going through a pretty fundamental change in the way the business operates. Yeah. So it really gets down to, and you know this well from product mindset and um, uh, lean product, it, it gets down to shifting the organization to a place where experimentation hmm. is the way that you discover the answers to the things that you don't know. Right. And and embracing experimentation as the muscle that you need to build now, but it means doing experiments well, like mm -hmm. having a hypothesis, designing an experiment that will test that hypothesis, having a control group, uh, pulling up what did we learn, actually having the governance conversation about mm. that. But, but it's, it, th and this is why this shift is so hard because a lot of organizations don't, they actually don't know how to run experiments well. That's right. And you've got to do experiment after experiment after experiment. And this has been written about by so many people smarter than me um, about how important this is to the, you know, title of your podcast, the innovation engine. Mm -hmm. uh, right. If you don't know how to experiment, um, it's going to be really easy to fall back into uh, old ways of acting. Absolutely. Well, and, and it's one thing that um, um, 
the 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 one uh, the, the one thing from Silicon Valley that always drove me the most crazy is is the embrace of failure, and of course it was meant to encourage experimentation, but failure is failure. So let's not let, let's let's not let's not embrace failure, but let's ex let's embrace learning. Right. Um, you know the only so I I, I now have a kind of co opted. I was like the only failure is not learning something. Yeah. Um, we I I can totally live with a project that completely fails. But if we failed to harvest any insight into what, what did we learn from this, then this really wasn't um, a good use of resources. Um, right. So if you and, document your hypothesis up front, if you designed a poor experiment, you don't have a control group, it's going to be really hard to learn. Absolutely. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yep. And, then, and then at the end of it, I can live with any failure as long as you can tell me what we learned. Um, mm -hmm. I just, that's, that is the good that I need out of this. Uh, uh, you know, that is, that is a non-negotiable. If you just tell me, oh yeah, no, these people just screwed up. And I was like, yeah, those are excuses. I understand that. Like, what did we learn? <laughs> like, please tell me that we didn't do all this and failed to learn anything. That would, that would be very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So, and then hopefully that also encourages other leaders to have some humility. Like I may not know, I am feel very strongly about this idea, but I, I don't know everything. And so I'm going to be open to that feedback loop and, and so forth. So it can be, can be really, really wonderful for the, uh, the, the quality of conversation between leadership and, and the people on the front line trying to, trying to make this happen and what they're, what they're struggling with. Absolutely. So if you don't mind, I'd love to move us into a little bit of a speed round that we like to do to, to round out uh, our, our episodes here in the Innovation Engine. Um, are you ready? Yes. Bring it. <laughs> uh, it's very threatening. Yes. Um, <laughs> other than, of course, your, your, your own two books, um, what recommended media would you recommend to listeners that has been really influential for you and your thinking? And this can be any, any type of media. Okay. Uh, so they're probably all three books. Uh, one that I love, Amy Edmondson's book, and I, I cite some of her work uh, in my own uh, on the fearless organization where she talks about mm -hmm. the importance of psychological safety. Mm. That, that research, I think, is so good because it's so important to what we were just talking about around Absolutely. learning and experimentation. And w with, without it, uh, it's very hard to do this well. So Amy Edmondson, Fearless Organization, great book. Um, for the kind of the inner work, uh, Brene Brown's The Gifts of Imperfection. Oh, yeah. Yes. Very, very good. Uh, and will help you not only in business, but also in life uh, and gets to that, <laughs> you know, all those you know feelings of personal worthiness and um, just just highly recommend it. Um, and then yeah, another she's, one. She's wonderful. She is. Yeah. Um, Another one, it's about 10 years old now, but Gerald Tellis's book, Unrelenting Innovation, hmm. uh, is, is probably the best that I saw in my own literature review on how do you create a culture of innovation within organizations. Hmm. So it doesn't get to the digital transformation, the business model transformation components as much, but again, back to what we were talking about, you know, doing experiments, learning, um, collaboration, all of that. Uh, Again, I, one of the best ones I've seen. Awesome, thank you. I've, I've taken down I, those. All three of those are texts I have not. Uh, well, Brene Brown, I know. Um, I've read so much of her stuff and listened to her podcast, but but Amy and, and Gerald's books I have not. So I will I will be picking those up uh, shortly. Um, I read that you you teach a weekly power yoga class. Pa the whole concept of power yoga seems bizarrely oxymoronic to me, but. Uh, um, but you say it makes you a better CEO. Can you, can you explain how? <laughs> yeah, of course. So just to be clear, power yoga just means you're moving at a faster pace. Hmm. Uh, so you do get a little bit um, more flow. It's the same style as Ashtanga. Um, hmm. You're just you're staying in motion more. Um, but for me, <laughs> and especially when I started, gosh, like almost 15 years ago, it was a form of meditation for me. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, that, that's still where I'm at. I, I, I've, I've, I've veered away from the power, power part. And <laughs> I'm just a very inflexible meditator. <laughs> that's great. Well, for me at the time it was meditation and movement. I now have a, a more traditional meditation practice. Um, mm. but it, and I even talk about this in Fearless, like the importance of as leaders getting to a place wherever and however we do that, where we not only quiet our mind, mm. um, but we can also start to tap into our intuition uh, mm. I think is, is a critical part of overcoming fear. 
Mm. And if fear is at the root of all of these things that we talked about, that fear of uncertainty, that fear of not having value anymore, we need as leaders, personal practices that get us out of our head, out of our fear. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, we were just talking uh, in our, we have a community of practice, a global community of practice on product management. We talked a lot about how important emotional self-regulation is. Yes. Because we are constantly facing people who feel emotional about what they're asking us to do or, or about what we're telling them we can't do, right? And so our own uh, mastery of our own self uh, is, is really critical in those moments in order to be wise um, and, and ultimately you know, be able to, uh, to, uh, to embrace what they're going through um, and not get shot. Um, while we tell them, I mean, the answer is still the same. It's not going to change the answer, but, um, but we can have a little more empathy and, and, and help them through that process because it is... I'm not going to get what I desperately think I need. Right. No, but you're going to get this other thing. It's going to be amazing. I know you can't hear me right now. So, we're <laughs> so anyways, um, that, that actually resonates with me quite a bit. Um, this is supposed to be a speed round, so I'll stop talking. Um, <laughs> where, where, <laughs> I'm too verbose for this. Um, <laughs> where can people go to learn more about you and, uh, and uh, pick up your book? Okay. So uh, LinkedIn is great. Uh, it's under Aisha Tierney Armstrong. Tierney is my maiden name. Uh, so that's me. Uh, Vectorist.com is uh, the company website, and you can get the book anywhere. Amazon's always great, but wherever fine books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, look, this is this has been a great conversation. I know I could go uh, twice as long. Um, there's so much I want to so much I I want to hire you. Um, <laughs> that's probably a good sign. Um, but uh, but this really is a, an interesting topic and and something that I think a lot of companies are 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 challenged with um, figuring out. Um, and so it's been it's been really great talking to you. Great great insights. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Scott. This was a great conversation.